Hello, a very good evening. I hope all of you are well. I'm joined by Dr. Dhanashree Jairam today to discuss uh, the heat wave in Europe. Uh, the heat wave has currently caused uh, more than 1,000 deaths and this has been this is being discussed all over the world and it's definitely a sign of concern uh, for not just uh, Europeans but uh, people around the world and we are just here to determine the factors behind it. Uh, Dr. Tanushree, thank you so much for joining me, ma'am. Uh, a very good evening to you. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Tanushree is currently uh, doing a fellowship in Berlin, so she's joining us all the way from there. Uh, so, it, 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 how's the situation over there on the ground and why is this different? Uh, and why should we have a reason to worry, uh, Dr. Dhanushree? Uh, so earlier this year, uh, India uh, and Pakistan and several other countries in South Asia uh, already experienced a severe heat wave. And it was a long heat wave. Uh, in some parts, even today, there is a heat wave going on in India. Um, so everybody said, oh, you know, this is a this is a problem in South Asia. This is a problem which we need to tackle. Uh, on an urgent basis. And now uh, the same situation is being experienced uh, in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, earlier it was only parts of Western Europe with uh, Iberian Peninsula and France, and now it's UK and today it's also Germany. So where I'm sitting right now, uh, the temperature is uh, is soaring uh, slowly. So uh, it's almost like 35, 36, 37 degrees Celsius, which is which is unbearable uh, to uh, to a certain extent for people living here, and there is a reason why it's different from uh, from heat waves, say in in a region like South Asia, which is already used to extreme heat conditions for a much longer period, which is not usual for for Europe, uh, which rarely experiences temperatures above thirty five degrees Celsius even uh, in summers. Um, the reason why it, it is uh, it is more crucial is also because uh, the infrastructure that you have uh, built in in Europe it's not meant to be resilient to heat. It is always meant for winters because there is there are long winters here. So the idea is always to keep the homes and offices and everything heated. And the idea is not to have uh, uh, ceiling fans or uh, or uh, uh, or air conditioning or any of these uh, any of these electrical appliances that south asian homes most of the south asian homes are used to of course it's it's a matter of luxury because not all homes even in india have access to air conditioning so uh, the buildings are not meant for heat conditions and uh, even even the infrastructure that is built outside is not meant for uh, heat conditions, and which is why these conditions are much worse. And and the, uh, and it's like something that uh, it becomes like unbearable, even if it doesn't go above say forty degrees Celsius. But the reality is, in many parts, the, for example, the temperature of the soil is above forty five degrees Celsius, which means that uh, you know slowly water is also getting evaporated. Uh, there are uh, there are increasing chances of wildfires, and you will see that many parts of Portugal, for instance, are currently experiencing severe uh, wildfires as well. So the so it's 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 a lot uh, uh, it's a lot like what's happening in many parts of the world. It's happening in the U.S. It happens in Canada, in China today. It's also happening. So it's become a global phenomenon. It's not something that is just restricted to. The developing countries or something like that it's happening all over the world and this has to do with climate change uh, very clearly and this is something we need to realize because there are a lot of uh, people who say oh this happened in the 1970s or 80s but remember that the frequency at that time was much uh, longer so you will you know have a heat wave and then maybe in the next 10 years you don't have a heat wave today it's becoming much more common every year there is a heat wave uh, even in in a continent like europe or every, uh, I mean, this is the second heat wave, in fact, in Europe, because we had one uh, a few weeks ago, and now we have another one now. So, which means the frequency and the intensity of heat waves uh, are also increasing at a rapid pace. So, this is clearly signs of climate change, and most of the scientists have established that extreme heat is possibly the most uh, evident sort of example of uh, uh, the effect of climate change and increasing temperatures on weather patterns and extreme conditions.
Um, what's the future uh, projection in terms of uh, how the weather's uh, trajectory is going to uh, turn out to be, you know? Uh, or will this be a recurring uh, pattern in going forward in the future? Is that something that experts have predicted? I mean, the IPCC report and several other uh, uh, other scientific uh, reports have clearly suggested that this is going to become more and more common. So we were going to see more heat waves uh, every year um, in most parts of the world, even parts of the world which did not see heat waves in the past, like, you know, you have wildfires in Siberia and, you know, Alaska and several parts of the world, which did not see temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius, for instance, right? So this clearly is a sign that this is going to become more and more common. And uh, if no action is taken, if we are going to have a business as usual scenario, as we say, and if we allow the temperature rise to shoot above that 1.5 degree Celsius limit that the IPCC scientists have also agreed upon, that this is the limit that we need to keep to, uh, and the temperature has already risen quite a lot in the past uh, decades. Uh, so in that sense, if this is going to continue, obviously the the, the heat waves and the uh, frequency and intensity of such uh, major uh, extreme uh, events are, are just going to continue further into the coming years. Uh, in that case, will we see any changes in lifestyle or the way in which infrastructure is built itself? Or is it too early uh, to say that because it's perhaps the first or the second heat wave that's happening and uh, until and unless there is a significant impact and there is a pressure on the governments to act, uh, you know, the governments generally don't tend to address many of these issues, right? Uh, that's a very important question and somewhere uh, action, when we talk about action, that takes a lot of time and we have seen that uh, that even with climate action, if you see, uh, we started the negotiations in 1992, but even today we are languishing well behind all the targets and all the goals that were set even within the Kyoto Protocol, right? So when we talk about, say, local governments and also uh, national governments, acting on climate. Of course, emergency preparedness, early warning systems, even India talked about having uh, more climate finance being directed to loss and damage because uh, heat waves are unavoidable now. You cannot avoid them. So if you have unavoidable disasters, well, how do you deal with them? And this is not a problem that was created by the developing world in the first place. So uh, obviously, the industrialized countries need to step in and start mitigating as urgently as possible. That needs to be the first step to actually put in place a certain amount of trust in the entire uh, policy arena of climate change for developing countries to follow suit, because obviously the developing countries also need to do something, right? So adaptation plans are important. Emergency uh, plans like heat uh, health action plans, for, for example, Ahmedabad, for instance, is the first uh, Asian city to have a, a heat uh, health action plan. Similarly, other cities in India are following suit. I'm sure it's the same in Europe as well as these heat waves become more and more common and you have more deaths and more damages and more economic losses. This is going to become a major problem. And uh, yeah, cities in particular, which have this characteristic of urban heat island, right, where you have more concrete and more infrastructure, which traps more heat and creates this effect of, you know, and where there are less amount of trees, for instance, it creates more and more uh, heat uh, uh, entrapment. So, uh, so governments are slowly getting prepared. I wouldn't say this is something that is uh, uh, being treated on an urgent basis. On a daily, le on a daily level, obviously behavioral changes have to be brought in about uh, uh, you know lifestyle changes, about energy uh, consumption. I mean, today we are talking about the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which is also affecting energy supplies to Europe. Uh, and uh, and the whole question in Germany is about burning more coal to try and save energy for the winters, where, as I said, heating is more important. But this is obviously going to contribute to climate change and uh, more uh, increasing temperatures, which would then have impact on heat waves in the coming years. So obviously there is a trade-off. You need to choose between these different options that we have. Land use change is another important area where I think slowly changes are being made. For instance, even in Europe where uh, those uh, wildfires happened, uh, they are looking at what kind of vegetation caused it. So for instance, in Portugal, it was a eucalyptus tree, uh, which is highly inflammable, which caused uh, these wildfires to become more rampant in that sense. So land use change is important. What kind of infrastructure we build? Is it something that 
can cope with different types of uh, weather patterns because we are talking about uh, an, a region uh, like Europe where you have cold, uh, like extreme cold as well as now we are seeing also extreme heat. So how do you adapt infrastructure to those kind of changes? Um, so there are, I mean, the, you need to also invest in technologies that can uh, that can help deal with these different kinds of changes. So yes, these these issues are being talked about, but uh, I'm afraid it's it's not uh, it's not something that can be set in motion very easily, or uh, uh, because uh, this is an action or this is a kind of action in which everybody needs to be on board. So people also need to un understand their consumer behavior and choices that may, that they make on the ground. Uh, at the moment, what are the governments uh, trying to do to mitigate uh, this crisis currently? Uh, I mean, it, it, there's very little that they can do that's in their hand, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, they can help the common citizens yeah. uh, overcome this. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, could you give us an idea of what exactly is going on in Europe? As of now, uh, I mean, the governments are obviously sending in a lot of advisories. That is the first step because, uh, you know, you you should not be traveling too much or you should be uh, hydrating yourself. So these kind of advisories itself is very important for uh, many people. The other part is obviously about mitigating climate crisis that you said, which is not immediate, right? So this is something that uh, that that is a long term and medium term kind of uh, changes that need to be brought into the energy systems and transportation systems and various other systems. Uh, so right now there is obviously a lull because of the Russia Ukraine crisis where uh, the focus is more on where do we get energy for the winter, the upcoming winter. That is that is a more important question that is probably uh, lingering in the minds of the uh, of the government officials uh, right now uh, but uh, but as I mentioned this this sort of heat wave that you're seeing is obviously triggering these conversations and the people are also asking questions and need more action so the question is do we burn more coal or do we invest more in renewable energy so then when we when we talk about renewable energy where are the raw materials going to come from? And Europe is also kind of trying to, I mean, EU is also trying to uh, open deals with countries uh, like Azerbaijan and Egypt and, you know, and so on and so forth. So trying to trying to just have, you know, natural gas supplies, reliable natural gas supplies, although I don't know how reliable these could be if you're talking about, you know, these countries as well. So, of course, these are tough choices that the government has to make. And uh, also, like in the past few months, like in, in Germany, for instance, we had... Um, uh, the government, uh, they announced the nine euro ticket, which is like applicable throughout Germany. So it basically uh, uh, it basically encourages people to commute with public transportation uh, and uh, avoid private transportation as much as possible. But but again, if you look at the public transportation, public transportation here is also not equipped to deal with heat. It gets extremely hot inside the, the, the metros and trains. So, uh, I mean, of course, the newer ones may be better, but then, so yeah, so that's what, so even even public transportation needs to be uh, adapted to these changing conditions. Right. In fact, I was uh, watching an interview earlier this morning where one of the kid who has finally woken up uh, to climate change and global warming because it's so hot in Europe right now, was saying that I ditched my Uber today to take the tube and it was so hot inside the tube. And I think some sort of a realization has dawned upon Europe. Uh, in that sense. But, uh, you know, in terms of the healthcare infrastructure, because over the last couple of years, Europe lost thousands of people during the COVID-19 pandemic. And slowly the infrastructure has also built up. But tell me, in these cases, uh, you can't really foresee how things are going to be. Uh, so in that case, what, do, what does the medical industry or the healthcare uh, system uh, be ready for in case of natural events like this? I mean, with with uh, uh, with the healthcare in particular, we I mean, all over the world. In fact, I don't think any part of the world is ready to uh, uh, the healthcare infrastructure is ready to deal with such extreme heat conditions if they affect the larger sections of the population. Right? I mean, we saw that in COVID when many people got infected at the same time. It was just a rush to the hospital, which nobody could manage. Some, of course, like in Germany, the COVID was managed uh, uh, rather better than some other parts of Europe, like in southern parts of Europe, like Italy uh, and Spain in particular were affected more. 
so the, i mean yes in a way the uh, the covid pandemic did uh, did kind of uh, you know make people realize about the kind of impacts that uh, that you know these countries can uh, be affected with in the future which also which also led to more investments in healthcare itself which is important from a government's point of view and also about you know how people also uh, react to such things so i mean you know one of the one of the things that everybody seems to show here uh, which is which is something i would say needs like a relook at is like i mean you know i guess most of the newspapers and most of the media uh, i mean news media channels are showing how kids and young people are just uh, throwing themselves into a pool or a lake and trying to you know uh, overcome the heat but the reality is something different i mean that is just showing you know one part of the story the reality is also about these hospital uh, beds actually getting filled faster and faster because there are so many old uh, people um, as well as young people who are getting heat strokes they uh, they are getting affected by various kinds of diseases on account of this heat you know so many people are falling ill because of this changes in the weather patterns and everything so the healthcare in healthcare in particular uh, will have to get ramped up even further in the coming years because climate change has huge huge impacts on health and it is not just in terms of you know cholera and diarrhea and these kind of diseases but also in terms of respiratory illnesses heat strokes and you know uh, 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 fatigue and dehydration a whole lot of other aspects which also have to be brought into the uh, into the picture and europe i'm i'm afraid it's also not ready for these kind of changes but it is happening slowly as is happening in the rest of the world as well this may be a little too early to ask uh, but is there a certain pattern in which the casualties have occurred uh, i mean in the sense that uh, suppose the indian diaspora or the south asian diaspora living there are they more immune to these heat waves uh, than the uh, european population or is there any statistics that's come out uh, till now as of now i haven't come across any such statistic which says if you know people of color for instance are affected lesser as compared to uh you know uh the other population so i'm not i'm not really sure about that uh but i mean you know from my own experience uh, everybody everybody is is uh affected by it i don't i don't see that okay there is a certain category obviously certain category of people who are in the marginalized sections who for instance don't have proper housing or don't have access to uh like water or you know uh, these kind of issues obviously will be affected more but i i don't see like if south asians for instance are experiencing or are affected lesser because uh, you know they come from a certain part of the world where heat waves have become much more common and was you know was already like a problem much before europe started experiencing it but yeah if there are statistics uh, statistics around it uh, yeah it probably might help also understand how how these things affect different people differently uh and uh, india you know uh, india has been facing a lot of heat waves and uh, there are hundreds of deaths that happen every year especially in the northern parts of the country uh, so in india what is being done uh, to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change in that sense uh, is there anything actionable that the government is doing perhaps at, at the central level yeah uh, so i mean at the central level as i mentioned uh, 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 as i mentioned earlier also there is there is this emphasis being laid on heat uh, action plans at different governance levels obviously everyone needs to be on board so cities have to be on board state governments also need to have their own climate action plans because the center cannot really uh, uh, have a say in everything because these are context based decisions that need to be made by government officials and uh, ministers even at the state and the city level for instance uh, but uh, 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 and these are like you know heat action plans emergency preparedness early warning systems and so on and so forth but i think what the indian government has also made it clear that adaptation alone uh, cannot be the way forward you know there is an urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emission so yes uh, india is also making some uh, strides in that direction by trying to you know uh, trying to uh, phase down coal consumption or trying to but of course you know this is a tough choice right now especially with energy crisis and inflation and everything that's a different question altogether and also you know uh, trying to 
put more pressure on the developed countries because you know climate change is not being created in just some parts of the world it's something that has a historical role as well which is something that is attributed to the developed world so the industrialized countries obviously need to start first as i mentioned so that's why the indian government is definitely trying to put pressure on the industrialized countries to act urgently and also talk about loss and damage as a specific aspect of this entire climate action because some countries are already making huge losses because of these heat uh, heat waves which is something that needs to be uh, addressed so on the on the uh, at the national level as far as i see the government is trying to put more emphasis on renewable energy uh, also just transition is something that is kicking in on a, on a uh, on a uh, on a larger scale now the coal ministry for instance is talking about just transition and coal transition the steel industry is talking about transition as well like those big you know heavy industries which are the largest users of energy so the right kind of signals are being put forth by the national government and uh, possibly right. you know this can have a you know a larger effect on the mitigation attempts of the indian uh, uh, you know uh, industries and other sectors as well dr nanashri thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, for this session uh, it has been extremely informative um, and insightful i hope we can have more such sessions in the future as well thank you so much thank you so much uh, viewers please do let us know if you have any queries for dr nanashri and we'll be happy to ask her the questions on behalf of you till then this is your motion sakti sakti